All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, we're back. Uh, just a few weeks after I took office as Attorney General, I and a number of other civic leaders, some of whom are here today, laid out a proposal for how the state should spend $36 million in funds that the state had received from settling cases against financial institutions that helped cause the 2008 recession by misbehaving in the federal financial markets. The Delaware Department of Justice had pursued those cases. It had settled them. And part of the settlement agreement was that this $36 million was to be used to remediate harms to the state and the communities that had been harmed by the alleged unlawful conduct of those financial institutions. Our proposal in January and our proposal today is that these funds be used to help lift up our state's hardest hit communities. That's what's called for by the settlement agreement. And speaking for a moment as an elected official whose top priority is fighting violent crime, investing in these communities is also what we should be doing if we really want to bring down the rate of violent crime. We're going to continue to prosecute violent crime relentlessly from this office. We just announced six homicide indictments yesterday. But indictments are not the entire answer. We need to build up these communities as well. That $36 million is now $29 million. $5 million was taken by the General Assembly in June to help balance the state's budget. We thought that was wrong. We still think it was wrong. Conversely, we agreed with the Joint Finance Committee just a few weeks ago that another $2 million of the money should be spent to enhance policing efforts in Dover and Wilmington, both of which have been experiencing unacceptable levels of violent crime. We thought that $2 million decision was a great example of how our office and the Joint Finance Committee working together could thoughtfully determine how to spend those funds. And we're here today proposing that the remaining $29 million also be spent in the areas that we originally proposed last January. Let me give you some specifics. We're proposing, as we did in January, that the money be spent in three areas. The first is on low-income children. We're proposing that $7.8 million, or about 27% of the funds, be spent supporting children who live in our low-income neighborhoods. Those funds would be spent in two areas. First, $4.8 million would be spent over three years providing additional teachers and paraprofessionals to our 16 highest poverty elementary schools in the state. And second, another $3 million would be spent over three years providing after-school and summer programs to children from low-income neighborhoods. We had to reduce the dollar amounts of some of our other proposals to account for the fact that there, that there is now less money to spend. But this $7.8 million that we are proposing for low-income kids today is the exact same number that we proposed in January. These kids need this help, and our state needs these kids to thrive. Kids who are growing up in poverty face challenges that other kids don't and we owe it to them to take the extra steps that are necessary to help them fulfill their potential. And along with involved families, that's also part of what's going to keep those kids out of our criminal justice system. The second area where we're proposing to spend is $10.7 million, or 37% of the money, to build up our lower income communities by providing financial support for reentry programs and substance abuse treatment programs in those communities, and by providing support for community policing and smaller nonprofit organizations through the state's Neighborhood Building Blocks Fund. Specifically, we're proposing to spend $3 million over three years on reentry programs, another $3 million over three years on substance abuse treatment programs targeted at that same reentry population, and $4.7 million to the Neighborhood Building Blocks Fund. The reentry proposal is the same as in January, and the reasoning is the same as it was in January. We have a 66% three-year recidivism rate in our state, meaning that two-thirds of the inmates who are released from our correctional institutions are back in again within three years. That's not acceptable. And it's destructive for the communities into which those former inmates are released, and it cannot be fixed for free. The money invested in the Neighborhood Buildings block, Building Blocks Fund is used for grants for a variety of community building efforts. This year it was used in the spring to support police foot patrols in the city of Wilmington and to support a workforce development program that's being operated by a nonprofit organization in connection with Wilmington's East Side Rising effort. An investment of $4.7 million would allow that building blocks fund to significantly expand the work that's being done by nonprofit organizations and low-income communities throughout the state and would also allow the fund to continue investing in additional law enforcement efforts, such as installing working video monitoring systems in high crime areas. And last, but certainly not least, we are once again proposing that $3 million of the funds be spent over a period of three years in the area of substance abuse treatment. I've been saying this since the day that I took this job, and I'll say it again today, that we will continue to aggressively prosecute drug dealers with the very able assistance of our frontline law enforcement partners.
but until we are effectively treating substance abuse, then the demand will continue and other dealers will eventually take their place. And that's without even mentioning the human tragedy that is represented by each person struggling with substance use disorder who we fail to help when we reasonably could. That $3 million we're proposing is the same amount that we proposed in January. One fair criticism of our proposal in January was that the proposed drug treatment funding wasn't concentrated in economically challenged areas of the state. So our proposal is that this $3 million be channeled specifically into treatment of offenders with substance abuse problems who are leaving our correctional institutions and re-entering their communities. The third and final area is housing. We're proposing that $10.5 million of the remaining funds, or about 36%, be spent on affordable housing. Specifically, we're recommending that $1.5 million be invested in the Delaware Mortgage Assistance Program, which helps people who are facing foreclosure, that $5 million be invested in the Delaware State Housing Authority's Strong Neighborhoods Revolving Housing Fund, which is dedicated to the creation of affordable housing in economically impacted areas, and that $4 million be dedicated to providing means-tested down payment assistance to eligible Delawareans wishing to purchase homes in one of Delaware's downtown development districts, Wilmington, Dover, Dover and Seaford. And first priority for this down payment, down, down payment assistance would be given to people who lost their homes to foreclosures after 2007. This last item is a little bit of a change from January. Back in January, only half of the downtown development district money was proposed to be spent on down payment assistance, and none of it was targeted at either low-income Delawareans or foreclosure victims. These settlement funds aren't required to be spent on people who lost their homes, but we heard from some members of the Joint Finance Committee that they would like to see some of the funds invested in this way, and we think that's a fair point. So we have proposed that change, which would double the amount of money available for down payment assistance and give first priority to foreclosure victims who would now have a pathway to becoming homeowners again. So that's our proposal for the use of the $29 million. And as with the $2 million that was just allocated for expanded policing, we have the technical legal authority at the Department of Justice to simply allocate settlement funds. But as we said in January, and as we have said throughout, the unprecedented amount of money that's involved here and the broad discretionary language of these settlement agreements has led us to the conclusion that we should not make this decision unilaterally and that we should involve the bipartisan Joint Finance Committee in this decision-making process. I think that decision-making process worked very well a few weeks ago with the money for policing. We came to the committee with a proposal. A lot of good and tough questions were asked, and we came to an agreement with the committee on some improvement to our proposal. It's my hope that this is what will happen also with this $29 million, and we very much look forward to sharing the details of our proposal with the Joint Finance Committee when it begins meeting again early next year. I've given you the broad outlines of our proposal. I also invited a few people here today who work in some of these specific areas so that they could hopefully give you a more detailed and textured understanding of why it's important to spend these funds in these areas. So I wanted to turn the microphone over to some of them to, uh, to again, explain the importance of investing in some of these areas. Uh, and the first is Monique Taylor Gibbs, who is a teacher at Warner Elementary School, which is one of the 16 schools that would receive funding under our proposal. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. As Mr. Dan said, I am Monique Taylor Gibbs. I work at Warner Elementary School, where I have been since I graduated University of Delaware in 2000. So I student taught there and I have seen many changes occur at Warner. Let me take you on a ride of what I get every day. Um, my father was murdered. I don't want to do the schoolwork. It's cold in our house. I haven't had electricity for two weeks. Miss TG, such and such is asleep. Let him sleep. And then I get, what are your test scores like? Why are your behavior rates so high? What are you doing for these children? I get children who come from one of the ugliest places in Wilmington. And how do I know it's one of the ugliest places in Wilmington? Because I also live in one of the ugliest places in Wilmington. I purchased my home at 21, living the American dream, not knowing that my dream would soon become a nightmare. I literally live two blocks away from our kids. So when they hear gunshots and have to come to school, I hear gunshots and have to come to school. When I drive to school every morning, I do a mental check who has a coat on, who's here, who's not here. Every morning I get to school and I call at least five parents to wake them up to send them to school. This 
is the picture of Warner. This is Warner Elementary, where I tell my friends this is where I work, and they take pity on me. However, I don't take pity on myself. I don't take pity on these children. We have beautiful children, and all they need is a chance. With this funding, this funding would mean the world to these students. As previously stated, a lot of the problems that we see in our microcosm of school is created in the community. So helping the community in turn will also help the school. And I am one who believes that school should be a holistic environment of help, and it should be a continuum of services for our students, and it should not just be about test scores. I had the opportunity for two years where I created a position for myself to come out of the classroom, and I serviced the students as a counselor as a homeless advisor, I help parents get into homes, I found furniture. These are the things that these, our schools need. This is the situation that is created in our community by poverty, and this is the reality that our children face. Our children are not worried about going to college right now because they just need to make sure that they make it home safely. They just need to make sure that they get to school safely. They just make, need to make sure that their brother arrives safely. Within the first month of school, I had two fathers murdered. I had one sister shot accidentally. I had four parents on drugs. And then you have the parents who are working to help make their school better. So these funds would mean after school programs. It would mean more adequate bodies in the classroom. It would allow us to have the smaller class sizes. It would allow the students to be able to stay at school until 6 p.m. and then just go home to go to bed and do their homework. It would allow Warner Elementary and other city schools to become exactly what these children need. And that is the safe place for success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to invite uh, uh, Tizzy Lockman who I, uh, I see is here. Tizzy is a member of the Wilmington Education. And I'm sorry to make you have to follow that. Uh, <laughs> Wilmington Education Improvement Commission uh, is also a, a parent of a, a student in our public schools. I wanted to invite her to come up as well. Sure. Um, I don't have an amazing prepared statement, and I wouldn't even try after that. It was fantastic. Uh, but I did. It was very, very important to me to be here um, as a co-chair, co-vice chair of the Wilmington Education Improvement Commission, um, but also in my role as director of the Parent Advocacy Council for Education at the Christina Cultural Arts Center, um, where we, uh, just as Ms. T.G. said, uh, have a lot of experience with students facing um, all of these issues in their schools and outside of their schools. And, uh, and really in my role as a commissioner, wanted to be here to support this proposal really strongly. I think it, it exactly the type of thing that the Commission is pushing for uh, in terms of recognizing uh, just holistically, as was mentioned, all these different parts that need to come together in order to make progress uh, for Wilmington and, and other struggling communities in Delaware. So just really proud to be able to represent the Commission here today and, and support the proposal of the Turn to Rural. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those who want a list of the 16 schools, we can, we can provide them for you. Uh, of the 16, eight are in the city of Wilmington, but eight are not, and then the schools are located in all three counties of the state, uh, Newcastle, Kent, and Sussex County. Um, Jay Street uh, is here today. Uh, aside from being a county councilman, uh, he has also been a, a very vocal advocate, both for support of our, our uh, high poverty public schools and for the importance of after school programs but for youth, and I wanted to invite him up, Mr. Street. You may end up taking the mic from me because <laughs> I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. Some folks are going to say I'm on repeat. But essentially, I'm going to say the same thing to you and support this today as I said to State Board of Education a couple weeks ago. In 1994, lead counsel for the State Board as we went into the unitary trial said his, his opening remarks were, Your Honor, these defendants have waited long enough. And I'm sitting there infuriated because I'm saying to myself, waited for what? But 
15 years, 14 years now after the Neighborhood School Act was, was passed, I would respectfully suggest to you today that our children have waited long enough. We had not one, not two, but now three task force appointed by the General Assembly who recommended unequivocally a weighted funded formula for high poverty schools. I take those three task force recommendations, your press conference earlier this year, your press conference today, as your acquiescence as Attorney General that there's a need to establish a weighted funding formula for high poverty schools. And I'm going to tell you the same thing, not trying to be disrespectful, just telling you. After 41 years in the arena, I know I'm not going to live to see fairness in the school system. But before I leave the arena, I'm determined that two things of significance will happen. One, a weighted funding formula for high poverty schools, and two, a reduction of the number of districts in the city. Now, what I suggest you do is tell the General Assembly <coughs> this year, they're going to spend some money on my children. They're either going to spend it in the schools or they're going to spend it on lawyers. It don't make me no difference. I'm preparing to do whatever I have to do. They can do what they want to do. I'm going to do what I think I have a responsibility to do because I'm not going to leave the arena better than I found it but I'm not going to leave it like it is, not without a fight. And second, I am the co-chair of public safety for Newcastle County Council. And what I have said publicly over the last two years, <coughs> our police departments and our police agencies will say, we can't arrest our way out of this. I agree with that. But we sure as hell right now have to arrest our way into it. And some of these hardened thugs need to be taken off the street, their little, <coughs> their terrorism, because you got a handful of street drug dealers terrorizing a whole city, a whole county, holding good people hostage in their own homes. It needs to stop. Like everything else, it costs money. So I support that aspect of it, but I'm primarily focused on my mission. I've been an educational advocate all these years, and this comports with what needs to be done. But something is going to happen. Some money is going to be spent one way or another. And I hope that it's spent on kids, not lawyers. Uh, George Krapansky is here today. Uh, George is the head of uh, Boys and Girls Club of Delaware and uh, is uh, as knowledgeable about anybody about the benefit of after school and summer programs. And I wanted to invite him up to, uh, to speak to that, George. Good morning. I know many of you share the same concerns that I have as it relates to young people and children across the state. We know that in the after school hours, particularly between three and six, the number of delinquency problems rise significantly. We know of the violence and shooting that's taking place in the northern part of our state. And we know of the heroin addiction, and the high suicide rates in the southern part of our state, particularly among teenagers. And we're all concerned about the growing stress and mistrust between law enforcement and young people, particularly of color. This proposal has a chance to help address I'm hopeful that our General Assembly will take the proposal seriously. This is the future. This is our city. It's our state. These are our brothers and sisters. And these are our kids. We have a responsibility. And I take it back. We have an obligation to step up. And I commend Attorney General for doing that. Let's hope it works. Charles Madden is, is here today. Charles is, uh, is not only the, uh, the head of the Hope Commission, uh, but also runs the Achievement Center in Wilmington, which is uh, running one of our state's largest reentry programs. And I 
asked him if he would come today to, to speak to the importance of, uh, of adequately funding reentry programs in our state. Charles, thank you for being here. So Matt, I want to thank you for inviting me and I want to applaud you for your continued efforts to bring resources um, to the city um, and the troubles that our, our city is facing. You know, I, I stood in the back and listened to some of the individuals who spoke before me and it became more and more troubling to hear what's happening in our city from people who are our leaders. Um, you know, I listened to Monique, who I've known, wow, I guess about 10 years. I think when I first met her, I was in corporate America and I signed up to be a big brother and um, I was matched with her son. And it's interesting because um, she talks about the neighborhood that she lives in and that her son has grown up in. And the fact that, you know, some years later, uh, her son is, I think, close to graduation from high school and is doing really well. And so I sort of keep up with her and him through Facebook. And to know that a man who, a young man who is in a community that has otherwise taken so many young men's lives and has really done, um, you know, some troubling things to our community. And she has had a village. So not just me, her, his uncles, and a number of men in that community have helped um, her son do well. And it leads me to why I do the work that I do. Um, many of the men that I see every day have often been uh, parts of systems that have not worked well for them. So it could be school systems, it could be judicial systems, it could be correctional systems. They've been a part of systems that have not worked for them. And oftentimes when they come to me, they have had what I would say a lifetime of experiences in those systems. And none of those systems at any point has taken an opportunity to really help these young men um, find the right path. And so while I think there are a number of things that are affecting our community, what I would submit to you is that fundamental to what needs to happen in our community is the support of men. So any man who I know of, including Monique's son, um, benefited from the relationships of other men. And when we live in a community where 60 plus percent of our men are disenfranchised, my sense is there is no one effort that is going to help change the trajectory of our community. So the work that we do at the Achievement Center is focused on those men who have historically, and I like to say chronically, been incarcerated. So from juvenile up through adulthood, they've been incarcerated. And I think it's also important to note that the people that I see at the Achievement Center every day are people who have they are the troublemakers. They tend to be the guys who have had a history of violence, both perpetrators and victims of violence. And so my hope is to try to support those men so that they make better choices going forward. And those choices include jobs, support for substance abuse issues, housing, and a number of things. So they're all encompassed in the, in the proposal that uh, the Attorney General has put forth. And I would just suggest to you that this, there is no singular solution, and I wouldn't, I'm not here to suggest that if you just work with the guys who are formerly incarcerated, everything would be well. But if you leave them out of the equation, it won't be well. And as uh, Dr. J said earlier, I refer to him as Dr. J, you're either going to spend money now or you're going to spend it later. And my suggestion is that, um, and this is statistically proven, for a fifth of what it costs us to incarcerate people, we can help people in the community do a better job. And so I know that as a matter of fact, and though our work is about a year old, um, our results are extremely promising. So when we look at the recidivism rates for the state of Delaware, um, I did a presentation to our legislator about two weeks ago, and I really talked about our first year of operation and where we are in terms of our recidivism numbers. And uh, my clinical director would caution me about, you know, giving statistics too early, but I think it's important to understand that so far um, we're doing really well, um, and keep in mind we're, we're working with the guys who are chronically incarcerated, so high-risk individuals. We're not taking guys who are sort of your, your what I call rookie, um, you know, law, law, lawbreakers. I'm taking guys who have been incarcerated or have been in the system for quite some time. And our recidivism rate is less than 15%. But again, it's early, so I, 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 I'm almost cautious to say that. But what I would tell you is that what we're doing works. What we're doing works has been proven over 30 years of research. And so we've incorporated a number of the factors that have been proven to work across the country in our model. But chief amongst our model is having people who really believe in these guys, who really want to help um, these guys return back to their families to be productive members of their community. And really the solutions are found in these men and their families. And so again, I applaud the efforts of the Attorney General. I applaud the efforts of everybody who's doing work um, to, to, to address this issue because as I said earlier, it's not a singular solution. We all need to figure out a way to contribute to this cause. But I think we all have to be accountable for our actions when we do so. So I think it's important that we measure our results and that we be able to talk about the results and we learn from 
our mistakes as we go along. So again, I applaud the Attorney General and the efforts of everyone in the room who is trying to help fix a community that is severely broken. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. I, um, I invited Colonel Setting, who is the head of the Newcastle County Police, to, to be here today. Newcastle County Police uh, has been at the forefront as one of our most effective law enforcement agencies, not just in, in uh, patrolling uh, the area that it is responsible for and doing excellent detective work to help us solve crimes that, that have occurred, but also stepping in uh, in other areas to help out when help has been needed. And Colonel Setting, in particular, I have found to be um, an extremely uh, an extremely effective spokesperson for the importance not only of doing the uh, the frontline law enforcement work but also of dealing with the complex factors that that lead to crime occurring in the first place and I wanted to invite him here uh, for all those reasons to speak to the importance of some of these initiatives Colonel thank you very much I I, uh, I pray that the General Assembly hears the plea of our Attorney General we are victims of the great experiment the great experiment has failed. The prison system is forced sobriety. We have more people incarcerated than China, than India. It costs us $64 billion a year. I'm not suggesting that we not enforce the laws. I'm suggesting that we change our ways. The great experiment is a failure. We have an opportunity to change things. Maybe we do have to change them slowly, but here is an opportunity to do that. I support the Attorney General. I support the, the everything that, that has come up today. If we're going to invest in our children and we're going to arrest less people, I'm fine with that. If there's a point where we are fighting fear versus combating crime, I'm fine with that. I keep telling people over and over again, I told a young lady from the journal the other day, that the end users of opiates are victims. They're hopeless. They're, they're helpless. They need something guide them out of the mess they're in and arresting them is not the answer we spent our money on prisons and I know that the Attorney General has me here because other chiefs would say build more prisons other chiefs would suggest that we lock up more people and we throw away the key I submit to you that if we educate and we rehabilitate we will be a better country a better state and a better city and I thank you for your support sir Thank you, Carl. Uh, Dave Humes is here from the Attack Addiction Group. Um, Attack Addiction is a, is a group uh, that was uh, formed by the family members of, uh, of victims of substance use disorder. Uh, Dave, is, uh, Dave has lost a family member to, uh, to drugs, uh, and he is not only an effective spokesperson uh, for, for issues involving drug treatment, uh, but also has burned up more shoe leather and putting more miles on his car than just about anybody that I know literally traveling up and down the state uh, to advocate for this cause and I wanted to invite him to be here today. Thank you for being here, Dave. Thank you, Attorney General Den. I wanted to support the Lifting Up Delaware's Communities Plan and speak specifically to the concerns of inmates and those being released from prisons. My son Greg was a really great, sensitive young man. He excelled academically through high school. When it came to sports, Greg didn't have the natural athleticism as others, but he consistently outworked them. He was regularly chosen as an all-star in ice hockey and baseball. The quote for his high school yearbook that I gave said, with the game on the line, I want the ball hit to Greg. That's the kind of kid he was. But Greg also experimented with illegal drugs in his mid-teens and into his early 20s. The experimentation escalated, culminating in his heroin use. Drugs take good kids to bad places. In my son's instance, his substance use disorder led him to prison. He had partnered in a convenience store robbery. His accomplice used a knife during the robbery. Greg never physically threatened anyone or touched a weapon. He was arrested and sentenced to three years. He was a convicted felon. Greg was incarcerated in Pennsylvania. There were no programs other than occasional AA meetings that he could attend. 
There wasn't even a church service that he could attend on a Sunday. Greg was not given the tools to succeed upon release. I know that hasn't been the case here in Delaware, and that Commissioner Coop and his staff are working on up updating existing programs. When it comes to sentencing those who have broken the law, we have to ask, do we wish to punish or do we wish to rehabilitate? If we choose the latter, how do we prevent recidivism? The FBI Uniform Crime Report as of this past Monday estimates that there have been 1.6 million uh, people arrested for drug offenses this year. Of those, 850,000 were arrested for cannabis. 89% were charged with possession only. It is estimated the cost of $36,000 to incarcerate, while the cost of treatment is $6,000. To rehabilitate and prevent recidivism, we need the $3 million that the Attorney General has earmarked for drug treatment opportunities for those currently incarcerated, as well as programs to ensure those about to be released have a plan to move forward in their lives. I'm certainly in favor of victim assistance funds and programs for those who have been victims of crimes. There's also a need for programs for families and loved ones to show how they can be support. When caught in the middle of substance use disorder, families don't know where to turn or how to help. The same holds true when families have a loved one first entering the criminal justice system. Helping the families helps the person being released, and that helps us all. There are those who released need assistance in getting back up on their feet. They need roofs over their heads. They need jobs that can lead to careers so they may feed themselves. They need post-release care. The proposed $3 million in grants to nonprofits to implement these plans is vital to keeping those released from returning to criminal activity. By doing this, we will keep the community safer and will cut down on crime. In one regard, Greg was a lucky one. I found out that upon his release, his parole could be transferred to Delaware. He could return under my roof. Many of those being released don't have that advantage. If they had been living with families in federally funded homes, upon release, they can't return. If the federal government won't help, then as a state, we must provide the help. Greg was also lucky in that I could employ him. His criminal background check as a felon was thick as a novel. In working for me, he didn't have to check the box. It was easy for him to visit with parole without fear of penalty, of loss of job. Far too many of those being released don't have those kind of opportunities. Despite all of that, my story doesn't have a happy ending. Upon release, Greg relapsed after being sober for 17 months and died of an accidental heroin overdose. Over the past two years as a state, Delaware has instituted several effective changes. 911 Good Samaritan laws, naloxone access laws, ban the box laws, decriminalization of cannabis. And we're making strides on removing three strikes laws that were well-intentioned but had severe unintended consequences. We have to seek new solutions as our philosophy of the last 44 years has not worked. We should provide funds under the Lifting Up Delaware's community programs so they can provide a cost saving to the state and result in better use of resources. We need to provide those funds so that there is truly equal justice under the law. More importantly, we should do it because it is the right thing to do. Thank you. Dave, thank you. Uh, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, the, uh, what it must take for you to do this work uh, is, is astounding and it's, I hope that you realize how many families 
you help in the course of doing it. Um, the last two folks that I wanted to invite to speak today uh, are involved in the nonprofit community, uh, working in some of our low-income communities. I mentioned with respect to our neighborhood building blocks fund that one area that we would like to be able to, uh, to help more uh, are some groups that are uh, frequently operating on a shoestring but doing some very important work in our community. And I wanted to give you some sense of some of the work that is being done. Uh, and uh, Minister Margaret Guy is the first person I, I wanted to invite to come up just to talk about some of the work that, uh, that her organization is doing. Margaret. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> this is two times too many that I have to stand before people and talk about the need for money in the city of Wilmington. Our babies are suffering. Our babies are really suffering. Uh, I'm the founder president of Stop the Violence Prayer Chain Foundation. I deal with children every day. We have an after school tutoring program. We have a food and clothing closet. You know, we have different programs to, we have a safe haven for the children. We have movie night on Friday night. And the things that these children come in and talk about they're afraid to even come out their houses to walk home in the evenings because of the guns and the violence. You know, it, it touches my heart. It breaks my heart to see a group of people who have the power, the General Assembly, what um, Attorney General Matt Den has been trying to get this money, it seems like forever. I mean, it's not about things, it's about people's lives. I mean, uh, the um, General Assembly, you're made up of a group of people. Do you have children? Do you have grandchildren? Do you have families that you care about? Open up your heart. You know, this is in Wilmington right now, but it can trickle out to where you are. It can spread out. We're trying to get this contained in, in the community. We're trying to stop it before it starts spreading out even further. You know, these babies, you know, the schools that go, they go to, um, they don't have everything they need. I mean, open up your heart. I mean, they, they, they just lost families to gun violence. They've lost brothers. They've lost sisters. They, they've lost mothers and fathers. You know, we care. We're the ones that care. You know, we don't get all this big money that everybody gets. We come out of our pocket to help these children. Open up your heart. These are babies. It could be your child. It could be my child. Open up your heart. Don't just sit there on money because you have the power to do what you want to do with it. Use it to save these babies in Wilmington. Use it to save these babies. So, Matt Dan, I'm with you 110 percent. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Sandra Ben is the, the last person who I wanted to, uh, to come up and speak. Uh, she's also, like Margaret, is uh, doing a lot of work uh, on a shoestring in the city. And I was hoping that she could talk a little bit uh, about some of the work that she's doing and why it's important for us to be investing in this area. Welcome. Thank you, Attorney General Den. It is very emotional, and I understand just how Margaret feels. I'm the pastor of Praying Ground Community Church at 41 East 22nd Street in Wilmington, right in the hood of Wilmington. I'm also the president of the Northeast Civic Association, and I'm the founder of an organization that we call Safe United Neighborhoods, which is known as SUN. And I'm standing today, again, before you to support the need of funding for our community, nonprofit programs like SUN and like Stop the Violence, and many others who are consistently working in the communities to help keep our senior citizens, our youth, and all of our residents and the community safe, clean, and informed. My program, SUN, walks the streets of the Northeast Civic Association, and we, on a weekly basis, along with the Wilmington Police Department, and we would like to do that on a daily basis so that we could be out there more and people could see that there are people that care. And we don't mind walking with the police, and I know some you know, are angry now with the different things that are happening, but we know we have to work together to make, this, uh, make our city better. SUN also uh, offers after-school enrichment tutoring programs. We have family fun nights. We have movie nights where we invite the whole family to come out and to just uh, enjoy an arts and crafts and um, enjoy re free refreshments. And like Margaret said, these things are coming out of our own pockets. And 
Uh, my, my church is very small, so it comes out of the small church pockets. And we've also acquired a small park where we have summer activities. We have marshmallow roasts and we have uh, music recitals. And we would like to continue to maintain that park, which is available for um, anybody in the community to use. We're very strong believers in that we must change the mindset of our youth, especially at the elementary level. And we have gone into the schools and taught the children about our SUN program and our SSR, see something, say something, and report something. And we hope that the children can learn at that level because they won't grow into teens that are trying to destroy each other today. We're asking you that you hopefully see the need to fund our, 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 our programs. We're asking the General Assembly not just to be hearers of what has been told today, but to be doers of what we're speaking today. And we're hoping that all together we can help change our communities. Our motto is a song by Matthew West, if not us, then who? If not me, then you. Right now, it's time for us to do something. Thank you. Thank you. 